Welcome to 2023, everybody. We made it. Uh, it's going to be a great year for UAP Studies Podcast. Welcome back, Jay. How you feeling? I'm I'm feeling great. I think this year is going to be awesome. We got some great guests lined up already. Uh, you posted a lot of it on Facebook. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm totally stoked about this year for sure. Yeah, I was worried that, you know, we had a hell of a year in 2023. How do you beat the likes of Jacques Vallée and Avi Loeb and Ross Coulthard and George Knapp and Leslie Kane? And I could go on and on and on. Big we list. did all that in yeah. like nine months. What are we going to do for 2023? And uh, it's like manifesting, right? You petition the universe and it just happens. And we're now booked three months out. So it's it's crazy. It's a very interesting time. Today's guest, super cool guy, uh, former military investigator, CIA operative. He is the alien hunter himself, Mr. Daryl Sims, 38 plus years of, uh, of uh, like forensic investigation. This guy goes at it with a cop mentality, not a UFO mentality. Um, and I mean, he's spoken in 19 countries. He's been on every paranormal TV show you can think of and on all the channels. So we're going to ask him all the big questions as normal and uh, super stoked for 2023. So we'll be back in just a minute with today's guest, Mr. Daryl Sims. Welcome back, everyone, to our first recording of 2023 of UAP Studies Podcast. I am Louis Borges. Joining me, as always, my best buddy, Jason Gilmet. How you doing? How's it going? It's You know what? I uh, We haven't seen each other in a few weeks because we've had some episodes in the bank for the month of December, and we kind of took a break. But uh, how have you been? I've been really good. It's been nice to spend time with family, and uh, I've missed it. I've been super ready for today and to get back into it. Uh, our lineup is unbelievable for this year. We grew like crazy last year, and uh, we're continuing with that growth. And uh, today's guest is uh, somebody who's been doing this 38 plus years. I mean, he's a reality TV star presented in over 19 different countries. Uh, this person operates the Houston UFO Network. Uh, he's a licensed private investigator, uh, former police officer and CIA operative. Uh, I've seen him personally on TV many times, but he's appeared on like the History Channel, Science Channel, uh, Fox News, CBS, uh, and many more. In fact, he was interviewed for the X-Files movie, and they told him, you're the real life Mulder. So uh, we're super excited to have on the show today, Mr. Daryl Sims. Uh, welcome to the show. I am delighted to be here. You guys are, have got your own history, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud to even be on your program. Well, we appreciate that. We're glad to have you. We'd be remiss if we didn't include, you know, the people who really have made an impact in this field. Uh, there's a lot of newcomers, you know, since 2017 and the Tic Tac video. A lot of people don't really know who's been doing this for years and years and years. And uh, we wanted to have you on the show and talk about uh, your past and your history. So maybe let's start with that. You know, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you did professionally, and what got you into this crazy world of high strangeness and aliens. Uh, crazy it is, to say the least. Um, I guess my background uh, first, um, I, I was a, uh, I, I went into the, I volunteered during the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, volunteered for the purpose of helping the country uh, in, a, in a time of war. I didn't particularly agree with the war, but that's neither here nor there. If you're called, you, uh, the needs there, you go. So I volunteered for that. During the time I was in the military, I became a senior military police officer. And then I uh, was uh, sheep dipped, which means uh, the CIA dips into the sheep, which is the military, and placed in the Central Intelligence Agency for two years. After I finished my tour, I uh, got out and uh, and then I started in detail concerning my UFO uh, uh, research and work. And the reason I was so interested in the UFO research, even when I was in the company and in the military, was simply because I was a captive audience at age four. That was in 1952. So basically, I was uh, an abductee at age four years old and... Uh, the uh, from that moment on that forever changed and colored my life as a literally a four-year-old they don't know anything they, they i never watched monster movies or anything so i was not influenced in any way in 1952 there weren't there weren't any alien movies on so to speak that i knew about and uh 
<clears throat> I simply remembered the entity coming into my room. Uh, he was in the room. I couldn't figure out what he was doing there because he didn't have any clothes on. And he was walking away from me. He was skinny. And I was laying in bed and I couldn't, I thought he was going to bump into the wall. And as soon as I thought that in my head, he turned around and he said something very strange because it was the first time I'd ever heard a voice in my head that wasn't mine. And he said, it's awake. And at that point, I realized he's talking about me because we're the only two people in the room. He turned around. And he had large uh, black eyes that were perfectly round, inch and a half across, inch and a half across. And uh, as a, kids look at things differently than adults. They just do. And as a four-year-old, I noticed he didn't have any clothes on. I'm freezing to death in my room. It's winter in Midland, Texas. That's cold. And he had no clothes on. I looked at uh, from his eyes, of course, were, which were stunning to me, and uh, looked down at his chest, noticed he didn't have any nipples on, on his chest, and he didn't have a, a belly button, and he didn't have a genitalia. And I couldn't figure that out at all. That just floored me. I figured if I have a TT, why doesn't he have one? You know, why didn't it, why, where's his belly button? I have one. And this just was a total mystery to me. The long and the short of it is that during the course of that event, something remarkable happened. He, at that point, switched me off, so I was not supposed to remember anything. And I don't know how this happened, with accidental or I just don't know. Uh, I learned how to switch myself back on. Now, that that didn't mean a whole lot at the point, at that point, but later on in my abduction of other uh, uh, abduction events till uh, they ended at age 17, I learned how to turn myself on in those events. Now, what does that mean? That means basically you get to hear what they're really talking about and what they don't want you to hear. And they don't know you're doing it because they think you're still switched off. So that's where I picked up a lot of information about the alien that I was not privy to because I didn't read UFO books and that sort of thing. So that's how that's how I got started in the UFO business because I was a captive audience and uh, my events ended violently at age 17 uh, in Almogordo, New Mexico, right outside Holloman Air Force Base. It ended violently? My last event was not uh, related at all to the UFO phenomena in the sense of the word that it, they were aliens. The entities in my, in, in my taxonomy of the alien and my taxonomy of what I think's out there is a little different than other people. Uh, I think that the alien that we're looking at, the, the seven primary creatures that are often mentioned in the UFO phenomena, the reptile, the greys, the Nordic, uh, this sort of thing, these particular entities, the DNA of each one of those uh, originates here on planet Earth. That's my opinion. And after 38 years of work, I haven't had much to change my opinion. But the entities that showed up in my room when I was uh, age 17, my last event concerning the UFO alien phenomena, whatever that is, occurred uh, with uh, five entities that don't show up in any UFO literature whatsoever. These entities, in my opinion, uh, were the ones who made, hatch, cloned, and manufactured these so-called seven alien entities that we have uh, basically in our UFO events currently. Wow. I, I've heard you say on other programs that, you know, they don't seem like actual extraterrestrials or beings. They're more like entities. And you refrain from the term alien, quote unquote, because you think maybe they're these are manufactured, maybe these are hybrid workers, or as Jason says, worker bees, and uh, you know they're the lesser of the actual intelligent species. That's uh, that's uh, again, uh, it's just information. It's nothing that I argue one way or another. It's informational. It, you know, any information can change at any time. As a police officer or former police officer. Uh, and uh, is a, currently as a private investigator licensed in the state of Texas, uh, any case you you involve yourself in, whether murder cases, whether kidnapping, which I've been involved in all of these as an investigator, uh, 
as soon as your information changes, that changes your view, so to speak. So if if I get new and better information, I'm certainly open to that. But my best information has shown us that these entities are hats cloned, made, or manufactured for the purpose of convincing uh, people they're abducting that they are aliens from other planets. Do I believe in aliens from other planets? Do I believe there are entities out there out there beyond Earth? Of course I do. I don't think these are them. I think these are something else that, uh, that we're, we're be, be, basically be, being played. And uh, that's just my view after all these years of doing the research. And one example I can give, if, uh, if I may, uh, in 19, uh, I think it was 1995, uh, one of my abductees uh, complained of uh, that they they were they had threatened her. They said if they told her if you give him any more information, him or his team, we're going to uh, abduct your children. And I said, young lady, do you think that they're not going to do that anyway? And she said yes. And I said, doesn't make any difference, and does it? I said, it's a veiled threat, of course, if it if, if true. And uh, long story short, she cried and cried and says, please help me defend my children. One of them's deaf and all this. And I said, I said, from a from an investigative point of view, that's kind of important to me. Getting a deaf person or a blind person abducted is kind of important. What sensory modalities would they use or could they be activated? during that event. I said, that's, it's, as an investigator, it's important. I said, uh, on the other hand, I said, uh, in the in the interest of humanity and you as a person and a friend of mine, in any way I can. Long story short, again, if the story is true, and I think that it is, uh, she assaulted her captor during the next abduction, it happened about a month later, and she tore his eye cover off. Oh. Well, if his eye cover comes off, then it's obviously manufactured. So the, the eye, she saw a red stipple screen with uh, uh, five or five or seven, I forget which it was, little lines that ran across the red stipple screen, like a pattern you might see in a, like a sine wave as an example on a, a, on, a on an oscilloscope. So these, uh, th this was a gray that uh, yeah. she... This was a okay. Yes, wow. So anyway, long story short, uh, people said, what happened is you hypnotized this woman to believe all that stuff, and it never really happened. The red eye is just something that you made up. And I said, okay, uh, that's a, you know, it's a, a fair attack. You can say whatever you want. You'll never convince her of that. I said, because he came back about uh, 30 days later, they came back and she tore it off again, completely tore it off this time. But this time I left a suggestion with her. I wanted the eye cover back because I wanted to see, I basically wanted uh, Freddy Krueger's hat pulled out right. of the so to speak, to use the metaphor. The interesting thing about that is in 1996, an incident happened in Virginia, Brazil, where the famous Virginia incident occurred all the aliens had bright red eye patterns. Yeah. No eye covers. Now this, everybody then apologized. Said, oh, well, you must have been telling the truth. I said, our research is solid. I don't really care what you think or what I think about it. Only thing I care about is evidence actually show and does it stand to this day? Right. That's the bottom line for me. And, and as an investigator, you're looking for proof and forensically and again we have a lot of people wanting to know like who actually has proof and i understand you have the largest personal collection of alien implants either you know excreted naturally from the body or surgically removed and that's a direct link i mean if anyone's looking for definitive proof if something was implanted in a person it shows a direct contact in a physical manner and b that there's items of, you know, meteor, uh, they're made of like meteor metals. It's not even things that originate on this planet as the implant itself. And that's pretty hard to refute. So uh, would you mind, you know, talking a little bit about your uh, your implant collection and how that all happened? I'll be glad to, uh, to address the implant situation, if I may. Uh, there, first of all, there are qualifications for a person being implanted. Number one, 
we have to go at it again from a police point of view, not a quote unquote UFO point of view. From a police point of view uh, or an investigative point of view, we want to know uh, the qualifications of the person that's getting implanted. Are there qualifications? Are there only certain people being taken? 45% of the people taken in UFO events are Native American, Indian, Irish, Celtic, or Scottish. That's just the truth. And uh, when I went to Turkey, they said, your presentation was wonderful, but Mr. Sims, you are incorrect. Uh, we are Turks. We are not any of those other things. And I said, our research stands on its own. It doesn't matter if you're Turk or Chinese. I said, you're not listening to me. I, I said, if you're, if you're Turks and that's the only separation, then you're the, you're the 55% that is not American Irish. I said, you're missing the point. But I said, I, you're still wrong. I said, whether you know it or not, I said, your people in ancient times lived in teepees. Teepees. With a little squiggly line on the top. I said, you don't know that about your own people. A year later, a, a, a scientist, a, a professor from a university, came to the United States, took Native American Indian blood samples back with him to Turkey, took the various Native peoples around uh, the Turk, uh, all over the Turkish country and compared the DNA and said, oh my God, we're Native American too. I said, I told you that from day one. Just because you don't know it doesn't make it not true. That's it, it, you, You've got Native blood as well. And uh, they didn't know. Then they had the biggest uh, powwow you ever saw in, in, in Kudra, Turkey, the, the capital because they, they brought over a bunch of native Indians and had a gigantic powwow because they were so happy that they were all native. I already know that. I don't need some scientists to tell me that. I already The evidence is already there historically. And the fact is that uh, the qualifications of some of these people is they might might be Native American and Indian Irish. Uh, they're uh, the, literally the, the devices themselves, it, that determines what what kind of device you're going to get or if it is and, and they're not devices in the sense they're the, the implants themselves are not um they're not uh they're not human origin there's no there's going to be no discernible technology in these implants i told uh 250 doctors and surgeons that at a presentation in 1995 at John Muir Medical Hospital, 1994, excuse me, a year before we did any public surgeries. I said, four things are going to be present if these are, if the objects I'm showing you in these x-rays are real and they're alien. There'll be no discernible technology. They're, they will be um, hidden from the body, uh, wrapped in a containment that's going to be biological. Uh, it will show no signs of inflammatory response, either chronic or acute. And so on and so on. I went down the line, of course, naturally everybody's sitting there, you know, like you have got to be smoking something pretty weird. And a year later, during the first sur two surgeries we performed, uh, the pathologist looked at the biology and said, well, that's probably an inflammatory response. I said, uh, I would like it analyzed anyway. I know what it looks like, but please analyze it. He did. He said, I'm not believing this. Those are non-inflammatory cells. And I said, can you tell us specifically what it is? He said, well, it's keratin. I said, translate that for the rest of the people around me. He said, well, your hair, your fingernails, your surface skin is keratin. Where did you find this? I said, deep inside the body next to the bone. He said, that didn't happen. That's impossible. Those are the exact words I love scientists and doctors to say because they... I said, we, we had this thing filmed with two doctors present. I'm a hypnotic anesthesia therapist. I did the hypnotic anesthesia and uh, uh, two doctors, several nurses and, and, and others present. They had 17 witnesses, including the, an attorney. He said, I don't care if God was there. He said, keratin does not, it cannot be inside deep inside the body next to bone. It's impossible. I said, okay, good. I'm glad to hear Put it in writing. He did. I was delighted to hear that because there's the keratin deep inside the body with the hemosiderin uh, complex uh, to, that was inside next to the implant. So what does all that mean? Well, what that suggests to me 
is that it's attached to the human mechanism and that that's part of the transmission of information to or from the alien through you. Right. And have you found that there's, uh, is it more the, the lower part of the body, like the legs that the implants are in? Is it in the arms? Is it located in the chest? Like where's the most prevalent uh, location of these devices? Brilliant question. Thank you for asking. No one ever asks great questions like this. They just ask, do you think I have an implant? Well, <laughs> not. the implants are extremely rare, extremely rare. When I meet all kinds of people, I look at hundreds of x-rays every year. 99.9% right. .9 of them are not alien implants. It's just stuff, artifacts and things. It's even people misreading uh, an x-ray or a CAT scan as an example. But the answer, the answer to your question, where are the implants actually found, the real ones? Uh, my former colleague uh, wrote a book when after the first two surgeries he did, and he said, um, he said, well, implants are found on the left side of the body. And I said, uh, Dr. Lear, that's just not true. Well, that's what you told me. I said, I never said that. Well, the implants you showed me are on the left side of the body. I said, that's the left side. Want to look on the right? Do you want to look at the middle part of the body? You want to look at the extremities, the hands, the feet? I said, I said, you're you're a UFO guy. You're looking at this thing like a UFO guy, and you're making these assumptions like absolutes that are just not true. I said they're they're in different parts of the body. Where they are in the body it has great significance. Uh, where they are located. Uh, how they're even presented to you. In other words, sometimes the alien will, they, they, they reached and got my arm, they held my arm like this, or they touched me on the shoulder, or they touched me on the head, they did this. I said, all those are significant things that you should have been looking at as an investigator. You missed the whole message. You're shooting at a barn, and you're inside the barn, with you got a shotgun, and you missed the barn by 15 yards. My point is that how the implant is even presented to you, how the, the location of where it it's actually going to be attached to you as an example. Um, in one case, the implant was in the hand. This was in uh, Italy. I was uh, doing a presentation there and a physicist was there. And he said, he uh, congratulated me on our discoveries of implants and all that. And he said, one of the things we found was one in the hand. He said, this guy had a huge behavioral problem. He said his behavior began to change after the implant, after his contact with the alien and that implant. And I said, you found that it was probably directed toward Meridian. He said, that's exactly the conclusion we came to. I said, all these are points people are missing, in my opinion, in the, uh, the so-called study of the implant. Uh, I just, it, it's, it, it's much more involved than we even imagined. And even the type of implants there are varied. Like I've seen you have pictures of ones that are like tendon masses. It almost looks like diamonds stuck to a tendon and other ones that are like, like brass ball bearings that some infant like had them in their nose or something like that. Like all kinds of crazy stuff. You are, you're so correct. There are implants that are, we have implants that, that are ferrous metal. We have implants that are non-ferrous. We have implants that are ferrous and also have ferrous metals in the same body, the same abductee. We have uh, implants that were a glass-like material, not glass, but glass-like. We have implants that were, uh, uh, it's one of them studied by the University of Houston that turned out to be uh, uh, ceramic-like material with a soft cushion on the inside. We think it housed a biological camera that was attached to the lady's eye in, the, in our amazing, December 8th, mass double mass abduction in 1992. So implants are made, in my opinion, and I told these doctors this, I said, I, I want you to not believe a word I say, but I want you to listen to the abductees that come to you. Because I brought two abductees with me to that 250 doctor presentation. I said, listen to your patients carefully. I don't care if you believe them. All I want you to do is test them do a biopsy of the area. In some of these cases, and I said, I think we're gonna see something amazing. I said, the implants you're looking at here, the metal ones and so on, most of those are, are literally uh, out of date. They're passe, they're 40 years old. 
the ones we, you're going to be looking for in the future, in my opinion, are going to be biological in origin. And if you do a biopsy of, and you find one of these locations, if that happens, if if my thesis is correct, and that's all it is, you're going to find nerve cells that are not representative of that part of the body. Not like the one we had in the initial uh, operation where we found keratin, you're going to find something quite different. In the biological implant, I think you're going to find central nervous system, CNNS cells, uh, central nervous system cells in that location, you're basically going to have a mini brain in that little tiny area. And have you found that there's any health issues with the people that have these uh, implants? Like, do they, do they have a commonality of being sick? Are they healthy people? Uh, is it a mixed bag? Remarkably good questions. I, I love your, I love that. Inquiring minds want to know. Right? <laughs> Our people want to know the truth. <laughs> they do for a fact. Uh, the, uh, the, the answer to your questions, it, it, it's difficult to, uh, to answer that question because it, there is not enough work really done on um, what I want to do is take all our abductees, all our implants. I want to take abductees that have had implants removed and abductees who still have the objects in them to a university setting where these people can be interviewed analyze, hooked up to equipment and everything else, and then in another room, activate implants that are re removed to see if they have any effect on any of the people in the other room. We also want to take some of the implants and reinstall them in animals and or uh, people who've actually volunteered. There are a lot of things that need to be done we have not done. It just, it just simply don't have the money for it to do this sort of thing. But uh, I discovered the implants in 1960. I'll give you a hint as to some of the possibilities. In 1960, I was age 12. I was wide awake during my abduction. Uh, long story short, I wa walked outside of my room and uh, because I was instructed to do so mentally. And there's a huge light on the, on the horizon. It's uh, like, I hate using movies as an illustration, but like the movie Phenomenon, where the right. light came in the sky and hits uh, John Travolta in the face and kind of knocks him on the ground. It was kind of like that. There was a huge light. And I realized it's getting brighter and brighter, beautiful, clear night. And I realized it's not getting brighter and brighter. It's coming toward me fast. The next thing I know, I'm in a lighted room in a, in a, what I, I think is a UFO because it was a circular room. It's a, all the descriptions of anything anyone ever described of a UFO inside and in that event, uh, again, I'm switched off at a certain point. I'm not supposed to know or remember anything. And I somehow or another use that same mechanism to switch myself back on because I want to hear what's going on. Now, I'm only 12 years old when I overhear what they're going to do and why. I broke down and started crying. I said, I've never harmed or done anything bad to anybody. Why in the world would they want to do this to me? And I was just mortified by what I found out. And I've never told anybody what that was all about because, again, it's a uh, that I, I don't know how I'd prove that. I, I have anecdotal evidence that supports it completely. But um, one of the qualifications of uh, and, and and I and and I ask your audience to. <laughs> To, if they're interested to uh, do that, they can email me on the uh, site at thealienhunter.com. And on that site, uh, you can email me and, and ask the simple question, what are the six things, the six reasons they take you? Now, that doesn't mean that you're an implantee, but it does mean that they take you. There's six, at least six reasons. There may be 600, but there are six that I'm, that I'll put my hand on the Bible, so to speak, and say, thus saith. I think those are true. And those six reasons, uh, two of those six reasons I fall in the category of. And uh, one of them is, uh, one of those things that I fit in the category of is how to, how to do things without being taught. And uh, I told this in a presentation in front of uh, Michael Lindemann of Time Pass, if you remember him. And uh, there were a number of people present. Dr. Carla Turner and her husband were sitting next to me. And uh, 
uh, uh, after the conference, but they were in the same room. And I was giving this presentation, Six Reasons Why They Take You, and a lady challenged me to no end. She was screaming, well, I don't believe that. And I said, I, I, okay, that doesn't mean anything. There are people who don't believe in the Great Wall of China either. Well, there's pictures of it. And I said, well, there's pictures of UFOs too. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, you can use the same logic to disprove anything. It, it doesn't, logic is not truth. It's a system of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's a good system of thinking, but it's not the truth. It's just a system of thinking. So she's, well, prove it. And I said, I, two of these of uh, six reasons, I said, one of them is learning to do things without, with either little instruction or not being taught. And she said, I'll prove it. And I, she, I mean, she screamed it. She just stood up in front of the audience, just made everybody really upset. It was at the Laughlin conference. And I said, okay. Uh, I said, I have a, at the time, I have a fourth now, but I, I was said I'm a third degree black belt in the martial arts. Lots of people are black belts in the martial arts. So what? And I said, um, that's true. I said, but they probably uh, took a course and were under years of instruction before that happened. What do you mean? I said, I've never had a teacher. I said, I am a bona fide third degree black belt in martial arts. And I've said I've competed in major competitions. The the guy, the, the, the martial art master Masoyama, the eighth Dan black belt to kill bulls with his left and right punches. He's a personal friend of mine. He's coming to he was coming to New Mexico to promote me personally. I said, so I I have a pedigree you couldn't touch. And well, what else? And I said, well, uh, good night. Um, I said I'm a master level in NLP, I, I'm a handwriting analyst and so on. Well, anybody can do that. And I said, yes, yes, but uh, it's going to cost you a lot of money and a lot of time to be able to do these things. I said, I, I, I said, I'm a, I'm an instructor. I have two instructorships in scuba diving. She said, so? I said, I never passed a basic scuba course. You're missing the whole point. You're thinking it's about ego and bragging and all that. You're missing the whole point. One of my implantees told me, well, there's nothing unusual about me. I said, you go feed that to someone else who wants to hear that. I said, you are, you, you are uh, Mr. Nobody. You look like Grizzly Adams. You look a big beard and overalls. And that's very impressive to, uh, to, to your friends because they know that you're an apartment uh uh, manager and you repair things. I said, that's your forte. That's the fact is you're a computer genius and you and I both know about that. And you're completely self-taught. There's nothing anybody can do about it. I said, they can call you anything in the world, but you're so far ahead of people. It is absolutely amazing in your particular area. I said, you fall into a category where things you learn or understand things and nobody knows where you get the information. You may study something, have an interest in it, and then you just take off all by yourself. I've seen people, rare people do this. I said, and the ones that I've seen are actually abductees. Now, are all abductees smart, brilliant, geniuses, or anything like No, 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 they're not. We have abductees who are certified geniuses. We have abductees who, their IQ is so low on the, on the IQ scale, I I can't figure out how they find food. <laughs> so if you uh -huh. think aliens are picking up people because they're all genius or something, you're absolutely 100% wrong. In fact, they are going to be the smallest category of people up there who are going to be the really brilliant ones, so to speak. It's just generally not true. So what are the six things? You've alluded to it a few times. And you mentioned that in your own personal belief, it's your ability to just know things without being taught. So that's one of them. But what are the other five and again, these are general rules, but what have you found? I'm sure our audience would love to know. Well, first of all, for me, I, I want to correct something, if I may, with the, with the greatest respect. Uh, it's not about my belief. My beliefs are irrelevant to me. The belief is belief I, I, I relegate to something that has to do with uh, something very high, high ultimate standards that a person might have. But uh, from a personal point of view, a belief in, about what something is or isn't that can be changed immediately by more information. Yeah. So 
uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, to answer your second question or statement, is that uh, there? I'll divide this up into three categories. Three categories of two each. The first category is spiritual and uh, psychical. Uh, they're not interested in Billy Graham. They're not interested in Gene Dixon or any big top psychic person in the world. They don't care anything about them. Nothing. Not anything about them. They're not. In, they're not interested in that. The level of interest they're interested in is what it is you do at the psychic or the spiritual level that uh, that is unique. It's not like anybody anywhere else. You think it's not. You think it's normal because you don't. You've never compared your skill or your ability or anything to other people. You don't do that. A lot of people just don't know or don't, they just don't know that for, for sure. That's as, so it's spiritual or psychical. Do I think all psychics or all spiritual people get abducted? No, I do not. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. I'm just saying that that is two of the things that they do look for in that particular category. The second one has to do with uh, science and technical. And it has to do with people who have skill, like my, like my, uh, the man I just spoke about, who is just a computer genius. It, it's guy's just absolutely brilliant, and uh, he has no real skills in the computer field. He just self-taught himself, and however that happens. And these are people who, again, not they're not aliens are not looking for people who are computer geniuses, computer smart. They don't care. They know more about this than you do. They could care less about it. But they do care of the fact is that you do things in science and the technical that is not natural. It's not, you do it differently than, than other people. And the other two categories, which has to do with psychological and the physiological learning without uh, much or any training, and uh, usually without much training, uh, and certainly not the maximum training that you should have to, to be able to do what you do, is uh, the categories I've found myself involved in uh, from a very early stage in life to later. But again, you don't know this is different because you never, you don't quantify that against other people or circumstances. I mean, when I was in school, I didn't, uh, I didn't have any particular skills or anything. I mean, nothing. I mean, I was probably in the lower third of the class, so to speak. I mean, there's nothing to brag about there. But when it comes to uh, doing things that I want to do or I choose to do, uh, like hypnotic anesthesia, being a fourth degree black belt in the martial arts. Uh, and one lady, the, the, the lady at that conference that wanted to start the argument, I, I, I said, you know, I said, I, I like a challenge. I like people like you. What do you mean? I said, I, <laughs> your arrogance betrays you. I said, I, uh, uh, I said, I know how to walk over fire. She said, oh, yeah, Tony Robbins told everybody how to do that. And I said, sweetie, I was fire walking when Tony Robbins was in diapers. I said, now let me have a little fun with you. If you want to, we and some other people can build a big fire out here and set it all up and I'll walk over fire and then I can uh, do some interesting things. Not for me. I said, I would like for you to walk over it. Well, I just get burnt. And I said, probably if, if you do it on your own. I said, but if you have the right kind of help, you can do that without getting burnt. Now, you've got to be asking yourself a question. Do you want to roll the dice? That's good. I can transfer my immunity to you. And she got, she sat down, never said another word. I said, I didn't think you had it in you. So we dropped the whole thing. I said, the, my point is, I said, you're, you're arguing about ego. You're arguing about yours is bigger than mine, or you're, you got a better car. Or you, it's not about any of that. It's about somebody out there, wherever they are, noticing something else that you do or have a propensity to that you may not even know yourself. You probably don't have a clue. But when you're put into the right circumstance, you may be able to do things you could scarcely imagine. And uh, some people uh, are on UFO craft at, during an abduction, do things that are amazing. The aliens are absolutely stunned by what they sense or think or imagine about these people. 
and then they sort they test them. They do different things. Can you do this? Can you do that? And they do all these little fun things that uh, the abductee has no clue what they're doing with them. They already so, notice something's there. So is it to nurture these abilities? Because, um, you know, we've talked to some people that are mentioning about being able to fly the craft with their consciousness. And, you know, the, the, the entities let them keep that memory. So is it to nurture these abilities in people? Or is it just to, to perpetuate that more into the population? Well, it may not be an Andor. It, it could be a chicken, chicken that bursts the egg, so to speak. In other words, did you develop those abilities after you got abducted or before? Were they latent inside you? Did you do this? And most people, believe me, most people in the UFO community that are abductees or contactees or whatever you want to call them uh, are not people wandering around with super abilities that they don't know about. I don't think that's true either. I think these are, uh, I, th I think. 98% of uh, or 96% of your DNA that they said was junk DNA, not discovered and so on. I think that's DNA. It's not activated. I think scientists just don't have a clue. So they think it must be junk or it must be something else. Uh, I think whenever you get thrown into unusual circumstances, and I'll give you an illustration here. Lady, a, a car, a uh, little child gets run over by a car and the mother goes out and lifts the car, lifts it clean up off of the child. And how do they do that? Well, it's an adrenaline flow in the body. There isn't enough adrenaline in your body to do that. You'd be dead if you had that much adrenaline in there. The fact is there's a, in the martial arts, we refer to this as key. Key is an ability to, uh, to, to, to manifest the physical aspect of the human body and do things that you're not able to do. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, and again, this borders along the myst mystical or psychical, or it, it, it's not any of that. These are things that any, any, every baby has key. If you, if you have a baby, you want to set him down on the floor and he wants to stand, you're not going to set him down. Why? You can't move his little legs. Well, they're just baby legs. Try and do it. Yeah. Make the baby if he doesn't want to make him stand if he doesn't want to my little daughter when she was uh about 10 years old had her hang on some uh on the on a, a pole i said and on a, a pull-up bar i said hang yourself there and just stand see how long you can hold on and she's well and finally after about a minute she dropped and so i i said okay now we're gonna do it again i said so i stood her up there and i had her focus on me and i talked to her for about 10 minutes she held on that bar and never, ever thought about it. That's key. Right. It doesn't make, everybody has it. It's not magical. It's not, you're special and unique and different. And I, no, that's just not true. We're all made basically the same way. Um, and it, it, it's, the question is, do you, do you want to, or do you have an interest in accessing that or not? It's that simple. I could give you a hundred examples uh, and even did a demonstration for a bunch of psychologists, psychiatrists, and ufologists on, uh, on this sort of subject and, and on screen memories and how aliens use, they are the, they are the progenitors, if, in my opinion, of the false memory syndrome. They are the ones who develop that to give you false memories so that you won't remember the truth. And if uh, if a person is skilled at retrieving memory through a different number of different methods, well, you can uncover that. You can and find out amazing things about what you thought was lost memory. In fact, it's real. So, you think yeah. Sorry, Jay. I was just going to say. So, in terms of these entities, and I've heard you say that they've never been honest with us. It's all been smoke and mirrors and games, and what they tell us isn't true. You know, it's almost like we don't really know the truth and they're it's not that they're here to like take over, but they don't seem to have that benevolent flavor. And I also heard you mention that, you know, the species everybody's familiar with are not really aliens from another planet coming here. And I've also heard you say that people have even said that there's alien craft in Saturn's ring. So what do you make of the whole thing? Is there like a higher level and then the species we know of coming here to do the work? Is it their agenda? Like, to sum it up for people who aren't as familiar with this topic as us, like what do you think is actually going on right from the top to what we experience? In a nutshell, I suspect that um, 
uh, that, uh, and, and we have to go back to the beginning. Uh, uh, in my opinion, the human being is unique. I think uh, that there's never been anything like you anywhere in the universe, period. Well, we're just pond scum. That's what your scientists are telling you. Someone from a long, long way out there, wherever that is, doesn't agree with that viewpoint at all. They came along. Let's say they came to Zeta Reticuli or wherever. They came here to get what you have. They didn't come here to observe pond scum. They probably have better things to do. And the fact is that, uh, in my view, that the taxonomy of the whole UFO phenomena would look briefly like this. <clears throat> it would take a half a dozen of these shows to illustrate this to any real degree to to anybody. So this is just an opinion at this point. It's okay. just my opinion. In my opinion, here we are on this incredible blue ball called Earth. And we're in this incredible situation where I think, again, we're unique. I think there's never been anything like you. I think if you divorce yourself from the spiritual, you divorce yourself from the psychological, you divorce yourself from the physiological, any of that, you take any of that out of the equation, you're already at a great loss. You, you, you've you already shot yourself. You're like the scientist says you're pond scum. Well, maybe he doesn't have a clue. Maybe he's he's looking at it from the box that he lives in. That box is pond scum. That's it. To beings outside that box, they have a different view uh, totally. They're coming here to get what you have. You're not. There's not anything like you in the universe. That's number one. Number two, that uniqueness is uh, is portrayed. I think in, from the beginning of our history, if we if we accept uh, ancient Sumerian, biblical, and other documents as a is an illustration of our origins, so to speak. I think that's kind of illustrated. I mean, what came into the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve? It was a reptile, wasn't it? Uh-oh. Well, how does that happen? Somebody has a distinct interest in changing your worldview from if you're going to if you accept the biblical version and and I do, uh that these people were there placed on this place for a particular reason, like for whatever reason, wherever, whatever God has in mind. And that somebody had a distinct impression and interest to alter that, to separate you from your, your beliefs in God and so on and so on. Well, that doesn't mean anything to do. It actually does. The, uh, there's, there are whole economies out there designed to do just that. One of them is called communism. And you say, well, uh, that, that's, not a, that's just a worldview. Uh, agreed. I understand that. My point is that when you go to UFO conferences and ask all kinds of questions, and I do, one of the questions I'll ask them, how many of you, regardless of how well you were raised, how well you, your parents loved you, how many of you know for a fact that your parents are not your parents? And you'd be shocked at the hands that will come up that are abductees. They do not believe for an instant their parents or really their parents, even though they can genetically prove it. Because you're told from a very young age, start at age four for me, your parents are not your parents. We are. We control it. We are them. We are the ones you need to be paying attention to. Therefore, if they are the focus, so to speak, and there is nothing else, there's no God, there's no anything, guess who the highest authority in the universe is? Well, it'd have to be them. Because that's the box they've created for you. And they're in charge of that box. So that puts you at a tremendous uh, disadvantage if you want to do self-defense, if you want to do anything outside their will. And uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of tough. The second thing is these beings, in my opinion, the seven beings, the mantis, the two, the small gray, the tall gray, the praying mantis, the reptile, that we saw in Genesis as a good example. It's also in other motifs. I've been to India. I've been around the world. Uh, those same images are carved on stone all over the world. So they've been around for a while. And they have a vested interest in uh, altering our worldview. And and why? Though I'd love to know the answer to that myself. I don't know the big answers. I wish I did. 
That's why I'm doing the research. I want to know what's going on. But these particular beings, if you look at the DNA carefully and honestly, without a quote-unquote UFO hat on, just get rid of your UFO hat and just ask questions uh, like a cop would. What is, yeah. How does all that... Where, where do you suppose you get uh, the so-called blonde hair, blue-eyed alien, the Nordic? Where do you suppose you get Nordic DNA? I'm going to take a wild guess here. Norway? Hmm, maybe that would work. Uh, where would you get uh, DNA of a reptile? Probably planet Earth. We have hundreds of species of them. You're probably not going to find it on Jupiter. Probably not going to find it on Mars. So I think probably the genetic that you'll be looking for all that stuff from is right here on this planet. And every one of these people, uh, I asked my friend Cliff Mahooty before he passed away, we were hanging out together for hours, driving up down the road at a conference. And I said, uh, tell me where the, uh, explain to me who the greys are. And he said, well, he said, uh, they are the star people. I said, Cliff, I am Native American and in Irish Celtic myself. Don't feed me the stuff you feed white people. Don't talk to me like that. Oh, they're the ant people. They're from inside the earth. I said, thank you. Said, that stuff works on white folks. It doesn't work on me. I know better. Our people never referred to them like that, and, uh, and they're not. I said, they come down in the UFO, so that suggests to everybody, oh, they're the star people. That makes a lot of sense. The only problem is it just ain't true. Well, the, they put me in a spaceship and bring me down from out there. I guess I'm a star people too. Funny, I think I live right here in Houston, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and Daryl, because uh, most of these um, experiences or, you know, experiencers, people have been abducted, usually come from a line of people that have either been abducted themselves or their children gets abducted. Um, have you ever inquired about that with your parents like, to see if either one of them ever had these experiences? Sharp as a tech. I knew it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I never told my parents anything until one day my mother, uh, who died uh, this this year, uh, she one day when she was watching the Ancient Aliens, she said, "Why, well, they, they when you were on there, they said you were an abductee. Well, that's not right." I said, "Uh, well, um, yeah, it actually is, Mom. Well, you never told us that. True." Why did why did you not tell me that? I said because of that goofy looking Boo Radley look on your face that I see now. I did not want to see at age four. I knew you would say it's a dream. You made it all up. You had a bad dream. I didn't have any bad anything except bad experience. The next morning after my abduction, I had a scoop mark about that big, as big as your thumb, on my little tiny skinny leg on my shin. It had been cauterized overnight. I didn't. I was playing with it, touching it, wondering where's the boo boo, where's the scab? Why? Because ki little kids pick at scabs. That's what they do. I didn't have one. The thing was already smooth, cauterized, and we've done analysis on things like that. And it appears to be uh, cauterized by a, a, a process in which a, an intense ultraviolet light cauterizes the wound instantly once the, once the scoop is taken. And that's the same exact material that we found around the first implants. The same exact stuff. To answer your question, do is, is this familial? Is it within the family lineage? It is. Uh, are all abductees all going to have people in their family lineage that are abductees? Not necessarily. Some cases they don't, but many cases they do. In our case, my brother, myself, my dad are all abductees. None of the girls are. None of them. And they your son, too, them. right? Your son had an encounter? My son is an abductee as well. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, people say, well, you've had horrific events or your son had horrific events. So, therefore, that colors your 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 view and that makes you anti-alien, so to speak. I said, you're missing the whole point again. 
I said, when I started my investigations, I made sure that I didn't, I eliminated things like the negative aspect and uh, religious context and all these other things. I didn't want to start with any of that. I wanted to see if any of it ever showed up and it did mm -hmm. anyway. I said, so you're, you're, you're questioning the wrong person. If you're going to take that approach. I said, the fact is that many of the, many of these people, uh, abductees are are it is it is related to your family in, in the sense and they say well that's a alien end you got an alien implant because you're you're uh because they, it's a tracking device this is not a tracking device for you or your family or anybody i said they know who you are they know where you're at stanton friedman asked me the same question are these implants uh uh transponders or tracking device i said no they're not stanton i said they already know where you're at they have no problem finding me at any time anywhere they want to find me and they can also avoid me in the same way and do in my opinion but in the beginning for the first 13 years of my life after age four they were able to find me at least once a year during these events and i've encountered most of the entities that we've talked about already I've encountered the grays, the two kinds, the, the reptile, the mantis, and so on. I said, so my point is this. Also, in my opinion, the last entities that showed up in my room, I said, they weren't any of the aliens. They were the ones who hatched, cloned, made, or manufactured them. And I said, that is the part that bothered me the most. I don't care about the alien. He's just doing his job. Are they good or are they evil? They're doing their job. If we have a we have a Nordic entity that was as treated one man as kind as anything you've ever seen. Later, the same entity tortured him. He's just doing his job. He does what he's told to do. You know, kind of like the Nazis. We didn't do anything wrong. We were just doing what we were told. Yeah, you you were doing wrong. You you knew you were, and you now you don't want to admit it because you're going to trial. Uh, the fact is that uh, people in power tend to give orders, and they expect those to be carried out, even if they are illegal, immoral, and everything else. And the fact is, at some point, there's always there's there's an old saying I like. It says, "The hand that delivered us into thine hand will deliver you into a greater hand." Now that's not a biblical or it, it's just a, a it's just a statement, an affirmation from one a countryman to another in ancient times. And he realized there's always somebody bigger coming, so to speak. It's gonna get beat up on your takeover, whoever, a bigger country, whatever. That's just the way it is. And I think that uh that the, the family lineage aspect of this is fascinating. It's not only family lineage, it's also racial. It's racial in the sense of the word, Native American, Indian, Irish, Celtic. And when I first came up with these stats in the 1980s, people looked at me like I had uh, uh, green worms crawling out of my hair. Where'd you make that up at? I said, we didn't. We analyzed every one of our abductees, and 45% of them are Native American, Indian, Irish, Celtic. I said, our statistics are staggering. Uh, when I, I told my dentist I have a rare drug allergy to the procanes that, that many of our abductees do, he just, he said, that's a, that's wrong. You're absolutely wrong. It's not only correct, 35, 35, one out of 35,000 people have a rare drug allergy to procanes. That's equivalent to three out of every 10 astronauts going into the astronaut program, all having a rare drug allergy to procanes. It ain't going to happen. It'll never happen. It won't happen. And for us to have up to 33% and some of our small studies have that kind of those kind of stats. It's impossible. And any dentist will tell you that they don't even check for it. What are the conditions? The conditions can be hives to coma. And we had one of our abductees fall over in coma when the doctor is is his he was going in for a, the doctor's looking to die because he had a hematoma in his eye, a, a, a puncture in his eye. He got that from an alien installing <laughs> a needle stuck through his eye. And he didn't want to tell his doctor that. And he finally told the doctor, and the doctor said, You what? <laughs> and the doctor, hand to God, true story, pick up the phone, 
and this is a top ophthalmologist in Houston, called a gastroenterologist. I know who it is. And he called him and said, we got another one. Hand of God, true story. Actually happened in his office. And uh, Dale looked at him and said, that's, uh, that stuff you're going to put on my eye, that's uh, got, it's got a procaine in it. He said, well, so what? And he said, I'm allergic to procaine. So he said, Dale, procaine allergy is so rare, we don't even test for them. They put the procaine on his eye anyway, and Dale fell over, and they took him away in an ambulance. He almost died from the event. So there's there's some repercussions to the, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, like I tell doctors, pay attention. Yeah. I don't care whether you believe me or not. Just pay attention. That's all that matters. Protect yourself. Daryl, we're going to have to have you back on because I think uh, you're the type of person that we can just pick your brain for hours and hours. So we'll definitely have you back on if you're uh, willing to come and, and grace us again with uh, some amazing stories and in your investigative work. Louis, do you have any final questions for our guests? I do have one final quickie. I don't want to get into Roswell, but I did hear you say a couple of years ago that to your knowledge, there was a living being from Roswell and it was still alive as of a few years ago. And I thought that was the coolest thing I'd heard. Anything you could say quickly on that? Yeah, Roswell was a setup. I Look, I'm from the intelligence community in the past. Roswell was the best, best intelligence operation in my entire knowledge ever put on anybody. Our, our military was, was literally hoodwinked from day one. We, they, how do you convince an alien to land and convince him that they're here to save the planet, fix those on hold and do all the wonderful things? Nobody in the intelligence community is going to believe you. However, if we you're allowed, if we're allowed to catch you, in other words, the ship crashed. We we were drinking that night. We must have been drinking some Bud Light or something, and uh, we just crashed into another ship. And there are at least two crashes that happened. At least two, and I guarantee you they were done on purpose. They didn't care how many aliens died. They only cared that you got the material, and that you got one of them alive. It's an intelligence operation. That's how they got inside our intelligence agency. We'll talk about it next time. Yeah, that's cool. Absolutely. That's cool. Is the alien still alive, though, is what I want to know. Probably at Wright-Patterson. I was just there here a while back doing a conference near there. They didn't show you either, eh? They didn't let me in. I, they let me into the Air Museum, which I found. I, I, could, I wanted to look at the... Uh, at the... Uh, at, at the uh, the, the 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 space the, the aircraft that was used to spy on the Russians, what, yeah. what did they call it? The, uh, uh, the 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 who was the the pilot that was flying it? They got shot down over Russia. Yeah, and, I don't uh, remember the name. Gary Powers. Well, yeah. anyway, when I was in the CIA, we, we kept him at our our location. Hmm. We kept him away from everybody because we didn't want anybody to tell. Him. He was supposed to have taken his medication. His medication was cyanide. He's You're paid in advance to do stuff like that. He didn't do it. He squealed and told them everything they wanted to know. Yeah. Wow. Is that like old school cyanide pill in a fake tooth or something like that, right? Then, back then. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that next episode. That'll be awesome. Absolutely. And Daryl, where can we find you online? Where Where can people look you up? If they want to locate me, all I got to do is go to thealienhunter.com. And if you want to contact me, click on it and it'll uh, automatically email me. I answer all my emails. I, and I get letters from people all the time. So-and-so didn't answer me. These people never answered. I said, I can't answer for other people. I don't, they're busy. They've got things to do. Uh, if I don't answer you, it's because I didn't get it. So send it twice. Nice. Daryl Sims, thank you so much for uh, joining us on UAP studies today. It was my pleasure, gentlemen.